the next portion of our time together, uh, we are going to spend thinking about delving more deeply into the, the story of Easter. Uh, we heard some, some readings reminding us of what happened thousands of years ago on this Easter Sunday, that they came to the tomb and, and it was empty. It was the most glorious, wondrous thing confounded them. They, they couldn't even believe what had happened. And so it's, it's our intent to make sure that we don't just remember and, and celebrate, but that we really delve deeply into the truths and the implications of what it means that Jesus is alive. Because one of the things I think is uh, most interesting about the Easter story is the fact that it's, it's kind of backwards from most of the other stories that we hear. And by that I mean, you know, most, most stories uh, about someone, they, they're stories of life and death, right? Life comes first and then death is at the end. In fact, whenever you put those two words together, that's usually the order that you find them in. We have terminology like a life and death situation or the life and death of... Um, of an important historical figure. The life is really usually the focus. I mean, because the life is where things happen, where um, they do things that are significant, that are important. But the death, you know, how someone dies is often also very significant. A lot of times that's kind of the the, the meaning or the the gravitas, the weight of the the story comes at the end with, with the death of the person involved. You know, it's interesting that a lot of stories that we listen to um, they end with death, and, um, and we don't seem to mind. Um, think of Shakespeare's tragedies. One of the first things I heard about or learned about Shakespeare's plays is that if it's a, a tragedy of Shakespeare, then everyone dies in the end. And if it's a comedy for Shakespeare, everyone gets married. So if you think about the, the tragedies, I mean, there's a lot of death, right? King Lear dies, Macbeth dies, Hamlet dies, Julius Caesar dies, Romeo and Juliet die. They all die, and yet we, we applaud at the end, uh, we stage them over and over again because there's still some kind of meaning there. It's, it's, it's significant. The death at the end of those plays uh, somehow seems right and fitting. As a more um, you know, modern day classic, uh, I'd invite you to reflect on the masterpiece that is Avengers Endgame. Uh, I think we all you know, were moved deeply by this movie and, uh, and, and especially by the ending. And hopefully you've seen it because I'm going to ruin the ending in a moment, which is that you know, at the end, Iron Man dies. And it's such a great ending because he spent all of those movies, all of that time trying to protect the people he, he loves. And at the end, he gives his life for them. And it's so, it's so satisfying. I mean, that, that is how we think of epic stories for the most part, right? There's life and then there's death. Death always comes at the end. But that's where the Easter story is unique. Because the Easter story, it, it's, it's backwards. It's life and then it's death. Or in this case, death is just one of the stops along the way, right? Jesus, Jesus lives, then he died, and then he, he comes back to life. In fact, he's alive right now. See, there's no other story like this. This is, this is key. This is central to the Christian faith. In fact, there's a part of the Bible where it says, um, if, if Jesus is not alive right now, then the Christian faith itself is pointless. Like it's worthless. It's not even worth believing. Let me uh, point you to this text. Actually, uh, in your welcome packs, if you want, uh, second page from the end, you'll have uh, the scripture that I'm going to go through. So if you want to look there, you can, or look in your Bible, whatever you like. But here's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. By which it means, uh, you know, if the Christian faith ends like all the other stories, it ends in death and that's it, then, then really it's pointless. I mean, to devote your life to someone who is dead and gone, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's a waste, a waste of a life. But that's not how it ends. That's not at all how it ends. Look at, look at the rest of this passage. It says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. See, Jesus, Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, that means there can now be stories that end with life rather than death. This whole theme of being alive is 
is what we've been working through as a church in our sermon series. That's why we have the, the big words alive up on our, up on our flat platform here because every week we've been kind of looking at what it means to be alive in Christ. That's what, um, that's what the verse says. I'll read it to you again. Uh, in Christ shall all be made alive. Another verse that we looked at a couple times over the past few weeks is Ephesians 2.5. He, that is God, made us alive together with Christ. That is the central hope, the central message of the Christian faith, of the Easter story, that Jesus is alive, and because Jesus is alive, we also can be alive in him. But it's important that we understand what that means. I mean, if you're a Christian, you might have some some sense of what that means, but if if not, if you're kind of interested in the Christian faith, you might be wondering, what what exactly does it mean to be alive in Christ? I mean, I I feel fairly alive right now. What, What would be different? So for the next few minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to give you three key things that we see in the Bible that um, distinguish life in Christ from, from all the other kinds of life. So three important things about what it means to be alive in Christ. Here's the first one. Uh, to be alive in Christ means that death is no longer a threat. That death itself is no longer a threat, no longer a worry for us. Now, death is one of those things, um, as human beings, we, we sometimes talk about it even in sort of positive terms. You know, we'll say things like, well, death is... It's just part of life. We have the idea, um, you know, made famous by the Lion King, that the circle of life, where Simba's held up. I kind of wish I had a lion cub, or at least a cat, because I could hold him, and you would remember the, the movie. And that's a, that's a very meaningful, impactful way to start that movie, because the new lion cub is born, and the idea there is that even though there are other, you know, animals that are dying, because there's a new generation, new life, there's hopefulness there. The only problem with that idea of you know, the circle of life, is that for those who are approaching death, it, it still doesn't usually feel very hopeful. Because even though there might be another generation that is coming to life, th- their life is, is ending. As I've, as I've ministered to people who are approaching death themselves or working with those whose loved ones are approaching death, e- even though there are other babies being born, that that doesn't take away the the pain and the hurt of the death that they are about to experience. See, death, death is the thing that we need an answer for. In fact, if we are going to be truly alive, we need a complete and certain answer for death. We need to be able to live in such a way that death is no longer a threat, no longer a, a reality for us, no longer a worry. Now to do that, first I think we need to understand death a little more. We need to really get to the, to the root cause of death because there's a lot of forms of death. I mean, people die of all sorts of things. Of course, there's disease, there's, there's cancer, there's, there's injury, fatality. I even read a story uh, this week about people dancing themselves to death. It was a long time ago in, in Strasbourg, the city of Strasbourg in 1518, there was dance fever that gripped the city and um, it happened, people just, felt the need to dance. In fact, they, they flooded onto the streets. There's hundreds of people dancing in the streets. The civic authorities weren't sure what to do, so their bright idea was to give them a place to dance. They thought they'd tire themselves off, so they got a kind of a hall, like a banquet hall. They put everyone in there. They got a band. They said, just play. They'll get tired. They'll, they'll, they'll get tired of this. But what happened after a few days is that those with weak hearts actually started to die. They keeled over. They didn't make it. So my point, my point here is, is that the real issue for human beings isn't a weak heart or a weak body or, or a disease itself. The, the real issue is the source of our mortality. I mean, for us, by this point, we, we think death is kind of a given. Like, it's obvious. It's just, it's just what it is to be human, to be alive, that there would be death. But, but the very fact that we all die, that, that needs to be explained. Why is that? What, how did that come about? And the Bible gives us a very clear answer. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, simply this, the wages of sin is death. It connects those two, those two things, sin and death. It says sin is the source of our problems because sin is an attitude of the mind and the heart that completely rejects God. God is the author of life. God is the creator of the universe, perfectly good, perfectly holy. Those who are in sin have said, you know what, I, I don't need any of that. I'm going to go my own way. In fact, sin is the thing. If we look closely at the, at the hardship and the, 
the turmoil of our world, the pain of our world, if, if we look closely, we will see that the origin of all of that, it always comes back to a heart that is, that is cold and hard toward the things of God. A heart that is mired in sin. See, human beings are justly punished because of our sin. And the punishment for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Not just, uh, not just momentary death that we experience here on earth, but eternal death. See, on our own, we, it's impossible for us to live a life without the threat of death. Because if we see ourselves rightly, we see that we are complicit in our own death. That we have chosen, we choose every day in our sin to turn away from God, to go our own way, to bring on further the punishment of death. The only hope that we have is that there would be one who would conquer death for us. And that's exactly what we have in the Easter story. On the cross, on the cross, Jesus did what we could not do. He eliminated the cause of death by taking the penalty of sin upon himself. And now the hope that we have, the, the, the joy that we have is that there can be life without the threat of death. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, a little later in the same chapter. It says this, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the whole reason that Jesus died on the cross was to erase the penalty of sin. For all those who would believe, sin wiped away in the eyes of God, the penalty of sin totally taken by Jesus and his death. So then to be truly alive, we can indeed live without the shadow of death hanging over us. But you see, it's only Jesus who gives us his answer because he's the only one in all of and all of humanity who has gone through death and come out the other side alive. And so because he is alive, those of us who have faith in him, we also can have life. That's the first thing about what it means to be alive in Christ. It means that the threat of death is no more. But the second thing, the second thing about being alive in Christ is that we are reconnected to the source of life. See, the essence of sin is not just that we go against God's ways. What it means is that we're actually cut off from God himself, from the source of life itself. Now, we can't always see this um, for humanity. If you look around, we, we seem fairly alive. Like if you look just in your neighborhood, anyone, whether they're a Christian or not, I mean, people seem, people seem fairly alive. But what we see in Scripture is that, in fact, everyone who is in sin, there has been a, a vital link that's been severed down in the deep recesses of our soul. It's kind of like... Um, I'm not sure if you've done much work uh, with trees, with shrubs, bushes, that kind of thing, but I don't know a lot about trees. But one thing that someone taught me when I was moving some, some bushes is, look, whatever you do, don't cut the taproot of the tree. He said, you move it around, but the taproot is essential, which I, I'm guessing is because the taproot is where, you know, most of the nourishment comes into the tree. So if you cut the taproot of a tree, the tree remains green. It looks still alive, but actually it's been cut off from the source of life. And it's just a matter of time before it goes brown and, and, and dies. That's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about sin. That we've been cut off from the source of life. So it, it may seem like we are alive, may seem like things are okay, but in fact, there's a deadness within us. And you may have experienced this. You, you, you may have known those who experienced this sense of deadness deep inside the, uh, I mean... We have all sorts of words for it, right? Sometimes we talk about it as, as, as melancholy or depression, um, existential angst, a, a feeling of hopelessness or lostness. All of these, these very common human experiences, they all kind of come down to the same thing, which is that we're living, but we don't really feel alive. And what the Bible would point to is, is the fact that that's, that's part of the nature of sin. In fact, uh, we see in the fallout after the first sin, Adam and Eve in the garden, it's not just that, you know, death is, they're condemned to death, but they actually are kicked out of the garden. They're, they're separated, cut off from God himself, from the source of life. That's what it means then to be human and to be apart from God. That we may, we may be living, but we're not really alive. Now, I'm not sure if, um, if for trees you can regrow a taproot. 
Maybe you can. I, I forgot to look it up. But, what, but here's the thing. That's basically what Jesus does for us. That, that when we are alive in Christ, it's as if that connection to the, the origin of life in the universe has been reestablished. And there's a beautiful picture of it in, uh, in the Bible in Psalm 1. Psalms are like poems in, in the Bible, kind of middle part of the Bible. And uh, I want to read to you Psalm 1. Here's, here's the picture we get. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. See What a glorious picture of life. That it's as if we've been like replanted right next to this flowing river, this flowing stream. We'll never run out of nourishment. That's what it means to be alive in Christ. That we now have a heart that has changed, that we actually delight in the things of God. This is possible because Jesus eliminates the barrier of sin. He reconciles us to God, so we're no longer cut off from him. In fact, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells within us when we come to faith. So we are reconnected to the source. We delight in him. And instead of just seeming alive, we actually are alive. That's the promise of God. It's what it means to be alive in Christ. True life. A life that is vibrant. A life that endures. So, to be alive in, in Jesus, to be alive in Christ, no threat of death, reconnected to the source of life. One more, one more thing. And it's this. To be alive in Christ means that we experience fullness of life. Fullness. I think, this is, I think this is what most human beings are pretty preoccupied with. You hear people talk like this. They'll say things like, man, I've never felt so alive. Or they'll say, boy, this is living. Whatever this is. And usually it's, they're putting their life in peril, usually, right? They're jumping off of mountains with hang gliders out of airplanes. They're bungee jumping. Whatever it is, there's some exciting adrenaline rush of saying, this, this is living. Sometimes, though, it's smaller things. Like sometimes it's just, you know, they've given up sugar. They've decided to eat only root vegetables and they're like, boy, I feel so alive. You have to try these beets. This is amazing. Whatever it is, clearly quality of life is, is really important to us as human beings. It's not, just, it's not enough that our heart is just beating. We want fullness of life. And do you know that this is, God is fully aware of this desire. In fact, um, I think we could say that God is the one who set our expectations for, for this kind of fullness of life so high. I mean, think about how humanity started. We started in the Garden of Eden, like a perfect, idyllic setting where the, the climate was always perfect. We had all the food we wanted. Relationally, everything was perfect. I mean, it was, it was wondrous. It was, a, it was amazing. And, and the hope that the Bible points to is heaven, which is basically a, a renewal of that garden, except now we will never die. We will never sin. It'll go on forever and ever. I mean, I mean, God has set the expectation for life very, very high. Which then begs the question, well, what about life now? I mean, that may be our hope if we're alive in Christ, but, but what about now? What, what can we hope to experience while we're still here on this earth? And for that, I'm going I'm to point you to the words of Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this, I came that they, that's like people, humanity, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the promise of Jesus is that when we are alive in him, we will experience abundant life. Like, like life to the fullest. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that it's uh, an easy life. It doesn't mean that l being alive in Christ means that everything's fine. There's never any hardship, any difficulty. In fact, Jesus says we should expect trial. We should expect tribulation. But here's what it does mean. It means that the deepest yearnings of our soul are satisfied. That we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are accepted. It means that the biggest fears of our heart are quieted. Rejection, shame, and death are gone. That they're no longer a part of our, the threats, the things that cause us concern or worry. And the greatest hopes of our lives are secured. We have purpose. We have freedom. We have belonging. Do you notice the imagery that, that Jesus uses here? He, he says that he is the good shepherd. And that humanity, human beings, we are the sheep. 
Now for us, it's a little unfamiliar for most of us, sheep, shepherds, but for the people at the time, this would have rung true for them. They would have totally got what Jesus was talking about because everyone, everyone understood that a shepherd, a good shepherd, was one that dedicated his life to making sure that his sheep thrived. Like he would lead them into the best pasture land. He would make sure they always had water. He would take his big shepherd staff and fend off all of the predators. For a sheep to enjoy fullness of life, it meant they had to have a good shepherd. It's the same for us as human beings. We need a good shepherd. Now this is hard for us because I think for most of us as human beings, we don't think of ourselves as sheep. In fact, for the most part, we tend to think, you know what, thanks very much, but I'll live my own life. I don't really need anyone telling me what to do or, or how, to, how to live or what's best. You know, just leave me, leave me on my own and, and, I'll, and I'll find the life that I really love. I'll follow the desires of my heart and I'll, I'll live it to its fullest. The problem with that is, I mean, honestly, how often does that actually happen? We're on our own. We, we get to the point of experiencing fullness of life. I mean, you may. Some people do. They're born at the right time in the right country with the right amount of wealth or resources. They work hard. There's a good job, whatever it may be. But here's the thing. How long does that abundant life actually last? Like maybe from from 25 to 65, 75. At some point, the body begins to decay. At some point, disease begins to, to make itself known. At some point, death reaches up and is and is grabbing hold of the life that we felt was so abundant, and all of a sudden, there's a lot less years left. And and the abundant life, the full life that we thought we had, is proving to be very, very thin. See, only Jesus can give us truly abundant life because he gave his life for the sheep. He died the death that we deserve, and he rose from the grave, thus pointing us forward to the genuine life that we can have in him. That it is not life that is momentary or short-term, it's eternal. It's glorious. See, Jesus freed us from the threat of sin and death to ensure that we would thrive in this life and in the life to come. That's what Easter is all about. That's why we we celebrate, make such a big deal of it, because there is no greater gift, no greater hope than the life that Jesus brings. The last question on the topic of of being alive in Christ is the shortest question with the shortest answer. And that is this, how is it possible? How is it possible to acquire this kind of life? And the Bible answers it in in one sentence. Ephesians 2.8 says simply this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. The access point to true life isn't something you do, isn't something you work towards, isn't something that you, you know, after a number of years finally attain. It's something that is simply given, something that's received because Jesus did all the work for us. He he acquired the life for us. He conquered death. And so we need only receive it. The reason that we celebrate Easter Sunday for those who already have faith is because it's so great to be reminded of these truths. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to celebrate. But the other reason we do it is is our hope. My hope is that those of you here, those of you tuning in, who are not yet people of faith, my hope is that your hearts are stirred by what you're hearing. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is something you see that you need to be truly alive. And if that's you, the the great thing about it is that all we need to do is receive it. It's just just an attitude of the heart. It's a a quiet prayer saying, Lord, I, I see that these things are true. I see that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Thank you, Jesus. I believe you actually died for my sins and rose again. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins and make me now into the person you want me to be? And there is the beginning of life, true life. So I invite you, if that's not yet true for you, wherever you are, in your car, at home, do that and then please contact us. We we would love to connect with you and help you to walk the road of faith, it, it's not meant to be done alone. The great thing about our time here now, though, as on Easter Sunday, is that we usually have baptisms. And in fact, in our first service, we had a baptism. Esther Van Roy was baptized. And a baptism is such a fitting thing to do on Easter because it really is a picture of death and life. 
The person goes under the water and then is raised up again, just as Jesus went into the grave and was raised up again. So we have the privilege now of hearing Esther's story, hearing her proclaim the hope that she has in Jesus. So what we're going to do is, uh, if you're tuning in at home, you're going to see her. If you're in your cars, you're going to hear her voice, hear her testimony. And then we are going to sing and praise Jesus for the life that he gives. Hi, my name is Esther Van Rooy, and I want to be baptized today because I know that I am a sinner in God's eyes and that no one but Jesus Christ can save me from facing God's wrath and punishment. In Romans 6, 3-4, Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, may live in your life. As Paul says, I believe that by Jesus' death, I have died to sin and have been resurrected to a new life in spirit, just as Jesus rose from the dead. This is the truth that I believe in, that I have been saved by grace through my faith in Jesus Christ.